Well, I came up with this idea about hearing voices uh, right uh, at, the, at the end, in the wake of Dr. Hurst's memorial service when he passed away in the fall of 2011. And it seemed to me that uh, he was such a seminal, important person in my life that I needed to write something about not just him, but all those people who had influenced me over the years. Uh, and so when I submitted this to Herb Fred at the Texas Heart Institute Journal, if you know Herb Fred, he's kind of a curmudgeon. He's about 88. And he said, Andre, this is no psychiatry journal. We don't publish things about people hearing voices. I said, no, Dr. No, Fred, this is actually about hearing the voices of your mentors. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll publish that one. And so, uh, so we're able to get that in. And, and I have, uh, it seems to resonate with a lot of people because, not necessarily of our generation per se, but I think people want to hear about this, this story. And I'm going to begin with the last paragraph of my article. And it basically says, although perfection cannot be fully achieved, striving for the unreachable can make us better human beings and better physicians. Mentors play a key role in this life journey and oftentimes serve as road signs to direct us. I hope that our younger colleagues will understand this principle and spend their lives developing a listening ear in order to hear the voices of their mentors. I stole that listening ear from a Robert Frost poem, I might add. Uh, the, uh, so this was really pitched, certainly for, for those of us of my generation, it's in the sweet spot, but it actually is for our, our younger generation of practitioners and learners and trainees to hopefully embrace, enjoy, and benefit from the years of practice and connecting to your mentors, and, and, and that'll be what we'll talk about. For the younger folks in the crowd uh, that are under age, uh, a little uh, under age 40, raise your hand if you know who Francis Peabody is. Uh, we got one person. Him, you got some work to do here. Okay. Now, Francis Peabody and Dr. S Dr. Charles Smith, who no wasn't alive at the time, but certainly knows about Peabody's writings, a key important figure in the history of the medical education and training, he wrote an important paper as he was dying of gastric cancer when he was on the faculty at Harvard at Boston City about the care of the patient. And the secret to caring for the patient is to truly care for the patient. And that's really the theme of what we're going to be talking about here. We're going to talk about coaches and mentors. I had a, I had a life coach and uh, my dad, um, and I'll talk about that some. And then I've had a couple of administrative coaches. You need all kinds of coaches is what I talk about in the article. You need a life coach. You need an administrative coach. You need a research coach. You need a clinical mentor coach who knows a whole lot more than you do when you get in tough times. Those medical men administrative mentors were John Stone, uh, the poet laureate of cardiology, as we called him, uh, who was at Emory. Uh, John's passed away. But John edited the great uh, book that was handed out for years by the Robert Wood Johnson to first-year med students called On Doctoring. Uh, how many people have that book? Great. Well, John, oh, that's good. That's a better sign. Uh, John was phenomenal, great writer, uh, just a hugely entertaining, thoughtful, and brilliant man who encouraged me to write, as did my father. Dan Fetterman uh, was uh, and still there at Harvard, the executive dean, uh, and had been at Harvard for me and has had many jobs uh, uh, being MGH, the chair of medicine MGH, the chair of medicine at Stanford, uh, the executive dean for Harvard, the dean of uh, student affairs, and just a very wise man. And so anytime I got into trouble in my career as a medical administrator, I would pick up the phone and call Dan Fetterman, and he would offer sage advice, and still does. So the key is keep your mentors close, closer than your enemies, for sure. Uh, but you need to keep your enemies close, too, I understand. Uh, and so we're going we're to begin with my version of Abraham Lincoln's Law of Cabin. And this is the Churchwell equivalent. Uh, this is where I was raised. My parents built this house in 1956. It's on 707 North 9th Street in East Nashville. And with the renaissance of East Nashville, uh, people knock on mom's door once a month offering a half a million dollars for this home that probably cost them maybe two or three, two to four thousand dollars to be built in, in 1956. And it's less than 2,000 square feet and seven people live there, my parents and five kids. I'm old, my oldest brother is a retired principal. I have a sister who's a, medical, who's a teacher. And then there are three docs. I'm the oldest doc and two younger brothers, as Henry mentioned. There were twins, eight years, my junior, identical twins. And I'll get to them in a minute. But I had a lot of lessons in that house. My father, uh, as I learned later in life, uh, you, know, you continue to learn. Hopefully that's continuing medical education, right? Uh, that, that, that he lived a modeled life. And great teachers uh, live lives that they hope you will model. They will share with you the most intimate parts of their lives with the hope and idea that you might actually learn something from it. And Dad did that, and as did, so did Willis, and I'll talk about that. Dr. Hurst lived a model life. 
Well, the largest room in our house was Dad's library. It was about 200 square feet. So, man, you can see the rest of the living space was pretty tight. But Dad was a voracious reader, and being a journalist, read everything. He had the Harvard Classics, every world book, Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, the place was packed. But he had this wall called the, the Hall of Fame wall, Hall of Fame wall, that he challenged all of us to see if we could get something on that wall, whether it be a degree from medical, uh, medical school class pictures that are here, his brother's Ross Clatt picture from Fisk University, 1938, marriage pictures, awards. Here's, Mar here's Muhammad Ali. He met Muhammad Ali when uh, Ali visited the Nashville Banner when he was meeting John J. Hooker. That's another story. And, and then when my brothers and, uh, and I became uh, residents, I was uh, actually at this time a cardiology fellow, and they were uh, first-year residents, interns, Keith at Grady, Kevin at Boston Children's Hospital, and pediatrics. He, Kevin was the failed son. He didn't go into cardiology, uh, but that's okay. He's done okay. He's currently the COO of Boston Children's Hospital at Harvard, soon to be the CEO in about a few years. So he hadn't done too bad, I guess. Uh, Keith, uh, but Keith did the right thing. He came and joined us down there, and uh, he doesn't like me to show this picture. Look at the size of those glasses. Lord have mercy. Uh, and so Dad said, I want to challenge you. Need it. When you get an award, I want you to put it on the wall, but you can't put anything up there other than something that you've accomplished. So he was very much into the life of the mind and challenging us to be our best and to, and to take maximum value of our education. When we get to uh, think about the mentors that were important is that he plugged into my head the idea of the power of science, which I was already aware of, and, but, he, but he was very encouraging about reading widely and broadly. So when I was, I think I told the story at, uh, at the dinner last night, when I was about soon to go into Vanderbilt for engineering school, my brother and I wanted to go out and make some money for summer cutting grass there in East Nashville. And Dad came to me and said, how much money do you think you want to make? I said, 300, 300 bucks to defray some of the costs there, Dad, to help you. He said, well, here's 300 dollars here and now. I said, great, I don't have to go out in the August humid son of Nashville, Tennessee, cutting grass for the neighbors. He said, no, well, you have to do something else. The only room in that house at the time that had an air conditioner in it in the wall was his library. And she said, if you come in the library during the summer and you read these books, you'll get three hundred dollars. One was the definitive biography of Ernest Hemingway at the time, and the other three books were The Sun Also Rises, Farewell to Arms, and From Whom the Bell Tolls. I said, gee, that's a lot of reading. He said, well, three hundred bucks and air conditioning. I can do this. So I did that, and I uh, got my 300 bucks. And the next summer, it, he'd bring out the definitive bargain of F. Scott Fitzgerald. He would say, okay, great Gatsby, you know, tender is the night, blah, blah, blah. And next year, it's another author. And eventually, I said, you know, this is actually not so bad. You know, I was actually learning something. And he began to get me to think that reading those books transported me from that little room in East Nashville to all these places that Hemingway wrote about, to Madrid, the bull ring, the bullfights. And so it was his very uh, uniquely gifted genius way of inculcating in our little brains the value of that. And, I'm, and when a great mentor of mine passed, Levi Watkins, so I think uh, the gentleman here actually trained at Hopkins knew Levi. Levi was the first African-American to attend Vanderbilt Medical School and went off to the story career at Johns Hopkins and planted the first automatic defibrillator as a cardiac surgeon, Morawski, with Dr. Morawski, who was the cardiologist at the time, was the front page of the New England Journal of Medicine, 1981. But he passed away uh, as he was uh, actually interviewing cardiac surgery uh, candidates uh, at Hopkins. And I wrote a piece about this in September of 2015, and I'm going to read parts of this with you. And it says, mentors change people's lives and careers forever. I, because of Dad, I do write some. He actually corrected everything with red ink up to about age 40. And he said, after age 40, you can write. And so I wrote, the education of Alexander the Great was entrusted to a teacher of immense skill and wisdom. His name was Aristotle. And the name mentor is derived from Greek mythology. It was Aristotle's role as Alexander's mentor that defined uh, the word. From this origin, mentor has become forever associated with a personal teacher, an intellectual role model, and a lifelong friend. I recently lost a great friend, Levi Watkins, Jr., a man who committed himself to several notable efforts, the civil rights of the downtrodden, developing the lives and careers of young minority physicians in academic medicine, and serving as an oracle on the struggle to equal rights for black people in America. His was a life like a bottle of cherished fine wine, savor it and meaningful until the last drop. He, like the many men of destiny, was on a life path to make a difference until the last moments of life. Such was uh, his case as Dr. Watkins was mentoring medical students when death suddenly over 
suddenly claimed him. Fortune afforded me the chance to meet him as a second year med student. I was sent on a career in cardiovascular medicine, and he, at this point in 1979, was beginning his storied surgical career at Johns Hopkins Hospital. I was sent to meet him by medical student mentors, that's Dr. Fetterman, who felt he would offer me sage advice. I arrived in Baltimore from Boston, excited and hopeful, and after meeting him, remained under his demanding, thoughtful, and career altering tutelage for nearly 40 years. Once he met you, that was it. Isn't that correct? You were, you, he, he mentored you and called you periodically for the rest of, uh, <laughs> rest of the time he knew you. Good mentoring has uh, such a pivotal role in the growth of a career-minded person. One of the challenges of a single-parent family often described in the African-American community is the lack of the other parent mentor guide. It is for this reason that successful programs that address the kindergarten through college career arc of African-American males maintaining maintain demanding but loving mentorship all the way to college and in some cases beyond. It is why programs like 100 Black Men, 100 Black Women have such a positive effect on the careers of young African-American students. My contention is that to address our larger STEM problem in public education, such lifelong mentoring will be essential and must not be minimized or neglected. A few years ago, I wrote a piece on mentoring called Hearing Voices. In this piece, I outline a young aspiring physician who requires multiple types of mentors to be successful. Some mentoring skills may be resident in a single person, but in many cases, one needs multiple people to serve his or her needs. And I cited examples, my dad, Dr. Hurst, and, and each mentor was sought for their unique skill set. That's the key thing for the students. Look for what they can add to your life. Once I recognize their value, I stay closely connected to each of them for their lifetime. We have begun a school, new school year at Vanderbilt uh, at, in Nashville, and, continues, and Nashville continues to grapple with the problems of our under-resourced inner-city schools. It is incumbent upon us to recognize we do need money and physical resources to improve our schools, but the human capital or effective mentors is equally essential. Many scholars of history point to the lessons and structures of Aristotle coupled with Alexander's genius in applying these lessons in warfare as directly influencing his success as a conqueror of nations. Let us hope that investing in effective mentors for our students, that their influence will aid them in conquering the great problems of science, healthcare, and other societal ills. So the power of mentors cannot be minimized or, or underrepresented in terms of what it can do to change a life. And I'm, I'm here as a living testimonial, as is Henry and Connie and Mark and all of us who are under Dr. Hurst and other great tutors. So the clinical mentors I needed, I needed a bunch of those. I mean, it was <laughs> not just one. Willis Hurst, Bruce Lowe, all these guys are in the Emory Pantheon except Roman DeSanctis. Roman DeSanctis I met when I was a, uh, I'll talk about him in a second, a third year med student at Harvard Med School. But Willis was unique in a lot of ways, but he studied everything and correlated everything with what that he saw. And there are a number of things he taught us that probably still haven't been published in articles, like the width of the QRS of a bundle branch block in people who are not on QRS prolonging drugs. If someone has heart failure and the QRS is extraordinarily long, more than 0.2 seconds, that person's ejection fraction is usually under 35%. And that's held the test of time. Now, that goes by the board if they're on drugs that prolong the QRS. But if they don't, don't have that and they have heart failure, the EFs are almost all generally very depressed. Bruce Loeb, which I'll talk about, was a guy that helped me make up my mind. Loeb was like somebody I'd never met. This tall, from Georgia, was an Emory quarterback when Emory had a football team, such as it was, uh, trained at Grady. And at that time, in the 1930s, there was no cardiology training program. So he went to England and got his cardiology training, came back, and was really the sole cardiologist at one time for the whole state of Georgia, and saw patients from Dalton, Georgia, to Brunswick, Georgia, coast to coast, from the, from the mountains to the sea coast. Saw pediatric cases, saw everything. Saw an abundant number of people, and from that developed this enormous res uh, repository of patient experiences from which he drew upon. And from him, I learned an important thing, and I, and I want you to take this pro properly, that in the middle of the night, when I'm collapsing on the floor here in your hospital, there are two kind of people that, that might come in my room. Someone that has read everything, everything, and the person who has seen everything. Now, obviously, I'd like someone who's an amalgamation of that. But in the heat of the moment, you want the person who has seen everything and done everything. And that's the value of learning from every single patient. That's what he taught me. One of his uh, mentees at Dorney was on the faculty, a know-nothing Brooklyn guy who came to the South, who took Logue to another level about using your gut. Which, which is, once again, another type of experience. And I'll talk about the gut as part of the brain, one of the three brains we all need. 
And then Joe Hardison, who was the chief of medicine, was trained by Willis at the VA. His main role, while they were telling you how to make up your mind and, and make decisions quickly, Joe was telling you to slow think. Because he'd come in the next morning when I was a resident and ask me the first thing, what'd you do that for, Andre, in his South Georgia drawl? What'd you do that for? You remember hearing that one? Oh, yeah. Hopefully not as many times as I heard it. But, uh, but I still remember uh, that. And when I'm about ready to go off the road and do something, I hear Joe asking me or telling me, what are you going to do that for, Andre? So it keeps me on the road, hopefully, and not veering off doing things I shouldn't, I should not do. The Sanctus, it was kind of the Eastern version of Dr. Hurst, and we'll, we'll talk about him in a minute here. But I want to digress and talk about another mentor, and that's Ken Walker. <laughs> oh, you know, I had this slide. Ken Walker was trained by Dr. Hurst, uh, and Ken had devoted, has devoted his entire life to Grady. I call him the monk of Grady. Never married, just lived almost in the hospital. Ken's in his 80s now, and was a chief resident at the time. He gave me this slide. Ken is, this is a slide when he was a chief resident. Ken weighs 250 pounds. He said, show this slide, Andre. That's <laughs> all so he wanted to be sure y'all saw that. But he doesn't quite look like that anymore. But Ken, about a year ago, and I think he sent this to Henry, too, sent this to me in the, by email, which is an example of how you, what does it mean to really connect with your patient? Truly connect with your patient to the extent of the intimate relationship and how, you, and how your work can affect the life of someone. So Ken, this guy sent an email to Ken. Uh, Dear Walk, I believe you were the doctor which treated me at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. Ken was in the Emory MASH unit in, in the Vietnam War. Uh, most hospitals had their MASH units, and Ken ran the one for Emory uh, in 1965. If you, are, if you are, would you please reply to this email? I want to thank you some 50 years later for saving my life. Have you got an email like that one? I didn't know your name until recently, as I had to inquire at the military personnel center in St. Louis to acquire my medical records from the time, uh, from my time in the Air Force. Could you please let me know one way or the other if you're that Dr. Walker? Ken sent back, my God, I was at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, and I must be the one. What did you have? I'm stunned. I'm so happy you are that doctor. It has been a long time. I'll try to summarize my case and how I ended up at Clark. I was experiencing pain in my legs, went to the clinic, where I was stationed, it was, I, and at first I was told it was to be phlebitis, but it continued. Then I began experiencing pain in my right chest. I went back and they, for pneumonia, and that fluid drained several times, and was given penicillin. I did not respond. I was sent to Claire, Clark Air Force Base, which is where Ken saw him. I believe there was another doctor there, and upon hearing my story, you immediately realized I had a pulmonary embolism. You put me on heparin, no tests, no tests, clinical history, physical exam, high index of suspicion, Mortality is 25%, first time PE. You don't have time to sit around and, and hold hum. So the Logue concept was in play, treat. Logue said, I'm a treating doctor. Are you going to be a treating doctor with me? When you, when you meet him for the first time as a fellow, if you didn't say yes, you're going to have a rough month. <laughs> and so I put him on it, and he said, uh, he elevated my legs. I truly believe you acted. If you had not acted so fast, I may not be here today. So God bless you and thank you. Your narrative summary of my case is quite lengthy to tell, but at the end, I mean, you, you have this sentence. I would be exceedingly grateful for a follow-up on this case. Well, I'm 72 years old, 22 at the time, still alive and kicking. So that's a pretty good outcome. Interesting thing is that in the early 70s, I started feeling the chest pain again. And so I fully drove myself to the ER and explained to the meeting doctor what it was. He, of course, was skeptical of my self-diagnosis, but, but, but I was adamant, and they ordered blood gases and did tests, and I'd thrown another embolism. I, again, was quickly put on heparin and brought under control. So this guy had thrombophilia, right? Some hypercoagulable state. Amazing the case was developed that late. But it pointed out taking care of someone in a thoughtful, patient-centric, meaningful way where you give yourself. Her said... One of the great doctors, good doctors, try to give a piece of themselves to every patient. And if you think about giving a piece of yourself to every patient, that brings something in your mind that hopefully you can relate to. That's a deep and abiding connection that you have. So I spent some time at Grady. And this is when I was chief resident. I had a lot more hair, and it was darker. And there's Dr. Hurst, and there's some students. We're going to do an EKG round, and Henry knows what that was about. Uh, Hurst was unique. He was trained by Paul. He was the last fellow trained by the legendary Paul Dudley White at the Mass General who started the American Heart Association, actually. And, but Willis was some uh, kind of unbridled, unique thinker. I think he would have to be called a transformative thinker now. One of the things he did, and he learned from White that he did, is that he would write letters. How about that? 
he would write a letter. And he would write a letter in a very meaningful way. Letters were not written as just kind of routine or some perfunctory thing to be sent off. It always had a purpose. And so he, uh, we actually had him to come down, was set had him come down uh, to talk to us in Nashville back in 05, but he developed a respiratory problem. And here's what he says. I was so sad I could not be with you at reception. I was sick with an upper respiratory infection that attached uh, everything from above my lungs, trachea, larynx, pharynx, and eyes. Although the infection was subsiding, the asthenia lingered. What's asthenia? Anybody know what that word is? The weakness, the fatigue. Neurocirculatory asthenia was a big diagnosis in the 1940s for young women. We call it mitral valve prolapse syndrome now. But that, that's, that, that, that's where that, phrase, that word, uh, uh, at least in the medical lexicon, came from. Everyone uh, from here gives me glowing reports about the gathering. We gave them a plaque. It was magnificent. I'm so pleased to have it. And here's the, here's, here's the, here's the punchline. I suppose all you know by now that all it takes to be a good doctor is to be kind, thoughtful, and responsive to your patients and study at least seven hours a week. Thank you, from Willis Hurst. Okay? So he's giving me another one of those ditties. Okay? What he's telling me, Andrew, you don't have to read 12 hours a week, 15 hours a week, 20 hours a week, one hour a day, cumulatively. Because he knew over years from training all of us we're not going to read that much. <laughs> We're not going to read 10 hours. We're not going to read 20 hours. But you might read cumulatively one hour a day. And he also encouraged you to do it, most of it, the last hour before you go to sleep. He didn't understand inculcation or incubation concepts that the cognitive psychologists all talk about now. That if you read about a problem the night before you go to sleep and you go to bed on it, oftentimes the incubation, your brain is still parallel processing even when you're asleep. You can solve problems, and that's why sometimes you wake up in the morning with a eureka moment. That concept is called incubation. Willis didn't know about that, but he knew that would happen, and he would tell you to do that right in the hour before you go to sleep about a complex patient. He's, when, he, when the book was written that, uh, that Mark Silverman, a great protege of Willis, did about his, his life, Willis's life, he sent me a copy. And here's what he, once again, for Andre Churchwell, I felt so good, one of the best. And then, things put aside tend to remain aside, JWH. So in other words, if you have an important project or a complex patient that you're trying to figure out, don't just put it away and never think about it again. He was already into the parking lots, the parking lot concept. Keep it close and proximal in recent memory and continue to work on it. So the, his instruction set was wide and continual. There he is there. I was fortunate to receive the first Minority Resident Alumni Distinguished Award in Emory in 2004, and there I was there were two of my great heroes, as Willis and as Bruce Logan, as the net winger back there, guys, uh, Connie and Chris. Uh, there's her late husband, Julius. And then this is one of my favorite slides. That's me with now two of my great teachers as Dad, and there's Willis, and there's Joe, Fel Joe Fellner, who taught us echocardiography. So uh, these things are key. Another letter from him, we had him come up to talk at, him, at Vanderbilt uh, for Grand Rounds, and I knew he was ill. He, Apparently had myasthenia. It was not clear, but it probably had myasthenia gravis terminally. He was having trouble walking. His energy was going down. So he sent me this. Looking forward to coming up. I'm sending you a large number of reprints. Please look over them again. Make copies. Understand the plan. I'll meet informally with residents and faculty Thursday morning. Interpret EKGs and so forth. And then here's again. Andre, this may well be the last visiting trip I make. So it means a lot to me. So the message to me is don't mess it up, church well. <laughs> don't mess it up. So he came, and he was uh, ill, but he sat and read EKGs and blew everybody away. And, and a testimonial to mentors that mean something to you is this slide and who, who was there. So you've got, here's Henry, here's uh, Wayne Shugall back there, and, and these are people who he trained that are on the Vanderbilt faculty. We were all there. There's Keith and his wife, Leslie. And uh, so these are all people he trained who admired him, but more importantly, had learned intensely from him and recognized his model life's value. And, uh, and so when he, when he went back to Atlanta, uh, I, an interesting thing, the, he had cases brought off the wards. He wanted to see real-time, not things that we had cookie cutter. So my brother was on consult service and brought an EKG down of some lady in her 80s who had gone to flash pulmonary edema and in shock, right after an ovarian uh, tumor resection at Vanderbilt. And he brought the EKG down and said, Dr. Hurst, what does this EKG show? And Willis looked at it, smiled, wrote something on it, and folded it and gave it back to Keith. He said, don't tell me what it is until you get the diagnosis. 
And so as he was leaving to go back to Atlanta, Keith ran down to the van and said, this patient has Takusubo. Her coronaries were normal, and she had the octopus trap look. And Willis said, open up that EKG, Andre. What is it? And so we opened it up, and it had catecholamine cardiomyopathy. If you go way back in the literature, it had been seen before, and it was called catecholamine cardiomyopathy. And essentially, that's what it is, if you look at the pathophysiology. Now, what he saw, there was a specific T wave change in the precordial lead that he saw. I, I got to show that EKG to you. But, and so that's the, that's the genius of hers. And so he wrote this. had a great time at Vanderbilt. Thanks to Keith and those. I was pleased that you have moved back to academic medicine. You and your group have put Vanderbilt on the map. Please thank Gail and John. These are other residents who had come. I enjoyed seeing them. Thank Keith Wren. Always thinking about people. Keith Wren was in the audience who gave him a reprint. Tell Rob, his, Rob Hood, one of the fellows who was on the faculty at Vanderbilt now, was the nicest uh, introduction I ever had. Tell him to send me another copy. And then this is the punchline again. My visit there will be my last trip, and I was over on my continent. He had never left Emory uh, in Atlanta after that trip in 07, passed away in, in 2011. And so it was really impressive for us, and I know Henry was excited, but it, it was a fitting in in terms of our relationship in that. He, when he got, went back to Atlanta, his wife passed away, and he moved into a, an assisted living. And that's an interesting story about the, the elderly women in assisted living seeing he was single. And there are some interesting <laughs> stories about that that I'll, I'll share later with Connie and Chris and, and everybody else. But he, uh, true to form, they would bring uh, cases out to him, bring the residents in a van once a week or so out to do morning report. Who else to give morning report other than the legendary Willis Hurst? So, uh, taught medicine 60, I'm now 90 years of age, so the intern and the residents come to my retirement home on the second Tuesday of the month for dinner and a teaching session. We usually discuss the pathophysiology related to clinical conditions. We occasionally discuss the current ethical problems related to medicine. And that's what this article, I recommend you pull this. This article is about that, how he was seeing challenges in modern ethics in the care of patients. And that's why he raised, once again, Dr. Francis Peabody, we need you. So go read about Peabody, please. Bruce Lowe. Bruce Lowe was about five feet tall uh, and was a dynamo. Uh, and uh, actually was, was one of Dr. Hurst's mentors, too. And I mentioned he was the, probably the first original cardiologist in Georgia and saw everything and ran the Emory Cardiology Program in the Emory Hospital. But one thing about him being five foot tall, you had to walk, and I'm six, two and a half or thereabouts. My, Lou Batty, who was a resident with me and I was an intern, could not keep up with this man as he ran up and down the hall seeing patients. And, and it was very hard to learn from him. Uh, we, one patient arrived, uh, was brought to the treatment room there at Emory in cardiogenic shock a week after an anterior wall infarct. And uh, they had called out the low, hey, there's a patient down there uh, that's sick. And he said, let's go down and see him. So he'd jump up and run down, we ran down the steps. Got there and Lowe went in, got the virus, talked to the nurse, talked to the patient very briefly, and with his stethoscope, okay, after he put his hand on the chest, he said, okay, we're on the phone. Spencer King, head of the cath lab, this guy has a two to one shunt, ruptured septum, come get him, take him to the operating room, quick, go. Uh, and so Lewis and I are sitting there saying, what? How? When? How do we learn something? So we finally caught him and we said, Dr. Lowe, Tell us about, how did you know that? And he started grinding his teeth then. Now you know you're in trouble. So we went back to, to, the, to the treatment room. He said, take your hand, put your hand on that. What you feeling? Bumblebees, right? Okay, EKG, anterior infarct, old anterior infarct, bumblebees, ruptured septum. Not mitral valve rupture, ruptured septum. Okay, let's go. <laughs> he was right. Two to one shot. And so after about a month of this, I still couldn't learn from him because I couldn't understand how he would process. He would only ask a few set of questions. His exam was extraordinarily quick and cursory. And so after about a few years, after sitting down, and I actually do a lot of deep thinking about how do I learn from these people, it finally dawned on me that Bruce Lowe, because every time he'd come out of the room, he'd say, Andre, Miss Jones, that lady, Miss Jones reminds me of Miss Carr. I saw at Grady in 1953. I said, whoa, okay. And it began to occur to me he did that every time. So this man had a photographic memory. And he had a Grady Virtual Hospital in his head that, that probably had, who knows, thousands of patients in them. And in each one of these cells, the patient rooms, there was Miss Jones, maybe her autopsy, maybe her cat, her EKG, her chest X-ray, her vital signs were all compartmentalized in these places in his mind. And he could go in, and he, had, he didn't do a lot of deductive reasoning. I had to learn from him a feature, I had to go read about it, associative reasoning which is basically kind of an electrical engineering concept called autocorrelation, 
where you just take what you've heard and quickly match it to the thing that matches closest to what that unknown is. And that's what the answer is. And so he had a phenomenal diagnostic skill set to be able to do that. And uh, so I finally learned that. It took me years to figure out how to learn from him. But try to learn how your master teachers learn and make diagnosis is another thing that I want to pass on. Roman de Sanctus. De Sanctus, uh, if Willis was the greatest cardiologist uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line, the argument had been that Roman de Sanctus was the greatest cardiologist east of the mason Dixon and north of the Mason-Dixon line. He was the head of, chief of cardiology at the Mass General Hospital and had, had been doing that many years when I first met as a third-year student. One month meant a lifetime with me because I began, I stayed, stayed connected to him the entirety of his career. Uh, he just recently retired at age 88. And this was on the front page of the Boston Globe, this picture in the article of him retiring. I'm sure in the Louisville Courier will have a picture of Henry uh, in about 40 years when he retires uh, with a similar discussion about his patients and how much they love him and what he's done. Well, I would occasionally send people who I saw in Nashville or in Atlanta back to him who lived uh, near New York, near Boston. And so there was a patient I saw uh, when I was at Crawford Long on the attending staff uh, who had an MI. And I sent the patient to Dr. DeSanctis to follow. And I'm not going to read this one. I will not read all of it. But I do want to make a point here. Uh, I'm going to read some of it. This will not, this, I'm not sure this is a billable note. And this will not be a note that your electronic medical record or artificial intelligence will transcribe for you. But I challenge you to not find a more literate, detailed, pithy, full of information note, nuggets of information on a single patient that you will learn from. And I'm going to pull out some of it for you here. All right. I had the pleasure of seeing Mr. Blank. Date. Date in the note. Do you put dates in your note? The day, the moment you saw the page? You should. I know you put it, it comes electronically, but you put it in there. Certainly, his medical history is very familiar to you, but I shall repeat it primarily for my own benefit. Now, why did he do that? He didn't want to insult the intelligence of the primary care doctor. He knows the patient. He may not remember everything about this patient, but he's not going to insult the intelligence and experience of the primary care doctor in that phrase. Now, 77, vigorous, vigorous, active. Gives you a sense about this man's vigor. His, his func you already know his functional status in one sentence, don't you? Okay, you don't have to write impression, New York Heart Association, functional class one. You got it. Okay, you got it there. He goes on, talks about he's at AFib for uh, in a minute, and then he has established AFib. That's what they called it back then. We call it chronic or permanent AFib. I like established. It's cool. Uh, and he talked about his work, and once again, a sense of his functional status. He has done well working very actively, traveling extensively. Uh, was in Atlanta in business in July 1989. Gave a history of tarry stools for a month, upper left side of chest pain, referred to the ER at Crawford Long, and his way he started lying. Excellent young cardiologist. Well, I was young, that was true. Uh, at Emory, uh, Andre Churchwell took care of him. Found to have a large bleeding ulcer, uh, spilled enzymes, uh, and he was on warfarin for his chronic AFib, and his uh, INR was elevated, and the hemoglobin was only 6.1. Uh, talked about the convalescence talked about uh, the medicines he was on, and then he said something very interesting. He does get quite sleepy late in the afternoon, early evening, and also complains of peculiar belching when he walks. There's a phenomenon in the old, in the old literature called belching angina that was diaphragmatic ischemia from the right coronary lesion. Okay, exertional belching. Remember that one. One of my colleagues who was older than I am remembered this. He wrote him, wrote him a note, Andre, I remember that, belching angina. Okay, put that one down. And then he went into detail uh, about his exam. Uh, and, but what's interesting here is that he talked about, um, once again, he talked about his functional status. Down in detail, look at this. Grandchildren, seven grandchildren. Do you, you put how many grandchildren in the note? Okay. Uh, used alcohol, some active. Now, this is what I love. Very active wholesale furniture salesman. I mean, you know what the guy does. Travels to the Caribbean, Canada, and carries a 45-pound suitcase with him when he's on the road selling. You really have a strong picture of what this 77-year-old guy's functional class was. It was phenomenal. Okay? And, and functional class one doesn't tell me the detail, the intimate detail and idea about what this guy can do in what, based on what Dr. DeSanctis has told you. He goes on to talk about his care. 
and I'm not going to go into that, but I, I think the thing I would like to point out, oh, one thing he does, Henry, which we need to start thinking about again, is he fluoroscopes the heart in his office, had a fluoroscope, fluoroscope machine. What do you do that for? Well, they didn't have echo. Uh, he didn't believe in echo. Let's put it like that. It was early years of echo, but he believed in fluoroscopy. And you could size the heart based on vers- transverse diameters. You could see if the heart was contracting. If the heart wasn't moving much, either he had constriction, tampa not, or you had a very severely impaired LV. You could tell by the pulsation of the aorta the type of nature of the cardiac output. How about all that stuff? Uh, and, uh, and then he goes on to, to finish uh, and talks about how he thinks he'll do. Uh, and I, I just think that the thing I love about him, and then, then, then look at this detail. Uh, told him to take off his nitroglycerin patch at night, which we all know about. Uh, and then I thought he could start making trips locally after the 1st of September. How about that? He wants to go to Ro- Rochester on September 12th, and I thought that would be all right. I, su- I suggested that Mrs. his wife at least accompany him on those trips. Okay. Now, you say, what is the big deal? The big deal is he knows him. He knows him to the extent he knows what his, his wife travels with him. He uses all the information about this man, the personal detail information, to wrap the care, the the considerations of his care, the descriptions of his recommendations are wrapped around the unique aspects of this man's not life. Not some generic, can start walking, so and so. I want you to think about that when you see your next patient. So when I, a few years ago, I was challenged to look at trying to create some uh, group called the Physician Service Council. I was concerned that we weren't really paying attention to these old precepts and ideas, and so I challenged uh, my dean and others at Vanderbilt to create a physician service council around physicians who really did clinical work full time to acknowledge that. We've always acknowledged people who get NIH grants and funding, nothing wrong with that, Mark, and, and, and who do basic research, but there's not been quite enough uh, attention paid to those who are the clear, what I call committed professional clinicians. So I put this together and I submitted this to the dean, and I'm going to read just a little bit of it. I included articles for Hearst and the Peabody article here. What is the phenotype of a committed professional physician? I think. To many in our group, this is the question that 800-pound gorilla in the room is to think about trying to make doctors better. Dr. Hurst talked about what good doctors try to do in an article. He borrowed from Peabody and those guys. So I've created a partial checklist of the habits, attitudes, and behaviors that, that I aspire to achieve every day, missing the mark, though. That's important. This is aspirational. Phenotype of committed physician. Hospital time is concentrated on patient care. Searches for or creates, innovates programs or systems to assist in taking better care of his patients. Reviews recent best practices in literature and role models, historical or recent, who have defined what it means to be a professional clinician. Hearst and Emory, Tumulty at Hopkins, Stead at Duke, Dr. Smith here, for sure, meeting him, the Sanctus at Harvard, Brittingham at Vanderbilt, and so forth. In most cases, the qualities are embedded in what I call clinical blocking, blocking and tackling 101. I'm willing to teach this to others. Calls this patient when the situation calls for it, bad news, new therapy. Visits patient when the situation calls for it at home. Strengthening patient doctor bond, terminal illness, you attend funerals, attend marriages, admits his own patients, and unless there's a good reason that he can't or she can't, still visits every day and is engaged in, with the care of the team. Sees patient in the ER to assist in care and helps in triage or admits, or at least calls, makes yourself available. Doesn't need a palliative care uh, counsel because has a relationship with the patient and family that allows you to deal with life and death situations. Views this as part of his or her ministry. Is always available, short of extenuating circumstances, to handle phone calls from colleagues uh, or admitting teams uh, on his patients. Values the light. The one I thought you all might like is this one. Serves as the person CME, personal CME person for his referring doctors, which I do, which makes them better doctors, strengthens their bond, visits the referring network to solidify relationships, and gets them Vandy Kentucky basketball tickets when Vanderbilt is beating Kentucky. That's important. <laughs> Don't do it otherwise when possible. It's comfortable with, with enough in his relationship with patients that if another consultant is needed, you're comfortable in making this happen. Always uses the best docs for his patients when it comes to referrals. This reflects on his or her care and solidifies your relationship with your patient, your patient family doctor. Tries to be timely. I think the key is being aware and around. Recognize the obstacles to patient family centric care and finds ways to solve those problems in a constructive fashion. Continues to push excellence in doctoring and hospital services, not as a means to an end, but as part of the continuum of activities needed to push and create momentum for the clinical enterprise to excel. 
Well, these are the kind of things I pushed, and we're actually now creating an academy of clinical excellence based on some of these ideas. Recognize this, 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 this didn't occur overnight. This note was sent to the dean and the leadership on April 2012, and we finally now are putting together the Academy of Clinical Excellence with a lot of these things embedded in it uh, for our young physicians. I'm going to end with a couple of constructs that I've come up with. I talked about brains. Your gut is a brain. How do doctors make decisions, thoughtful decisions? Well, you've got three brains, at least I would contend. Your gut, the lessons learned, good, bad, or otherwise. I've learned just as much from, unfortunately, bad decisions I've made as from good decisions. Your knowledge, book knowledge, you got to have it, and your heart. What would you do if it's your family member, the golden rule, humanism, parental teachings? And then trying to make decisions where there's a balance in the knowing and caring. From the other side of it, what kind of sustains a doctor for a lifetime of care, and then therefore what drives the doctor's behavior, good or bad? These are the things I think are the drivers with different gain factors or amplification factors for each individual person. Search it for yourself. Inner satisfaction of serving mankind. The money. Human to human connection, which is a social animal thing. We all have it. Application of evidence-based information. People love to practice in a scientific way. Intellectual exercise of patient decision-making. Uncertainty management and task prioritization. So what is the right balance of those gain factors? You have to answer that for yourself. But there's certainly a confluence of this side of the equation and this side of the equation that are involved in helping us all make decisions moment to moment. Because when we make decisions, we don't have all the information. Some people have a heck of a time making a decision because they don't have all the data. And that's that uncertainty management, making decisions in times of uncertainty. Dr. Not, not Loeb love to push you on that one. You've got to make, make up your mind. Make up your mind, Andre. Use your experience. Use what you know in your books. Make up your mind right then and there. And then you have to use that task fast, the task parking lot concept I'm sure you're aware of. So when you're seeing things about patients or other things, categorize them. Not urgent, not important, very urgent. Very, you better deal with this one very quickly. This can be put someplace else. And then, then the other uh, aspects of the variations of that. You can place them, something that's not important, not urgent, put that one in long-term parking. Somebody's crashing on the floor, you need to make a decision. That goes curbside to the brain. So as a young trainee, as a young learner, this is a way to help shape your priorities. In concluding here, about 2004, we created the, we named the residency program after Dr. Hurst, and a plaque was placed from one of his famous quotations, and this is how I will end. Dr. Hurst said, the practice of medicine is predominantly a humanistic act. Physicians must care about their patients and must constantly improve their scientific knowledge about disease. To care and not know is dangerous. It's dangerous. To know and not care is worse. It's actually immoral. That's what it is. Caring and knowing must be combined to succeed in doctoring. And I would offer, as a postscript, in equal amounts. I think as I end the talk, I would once again challenge our young trainees here, students, uh, residents, and young uh, attending physicians, to look at creating those linkages and, and bonds to your mentors. Look for different kinds of mentors. Stay connected with, to, with them by whatever means you all normally use these years, the social media, the, whatever the stuff you all are doing. I usually still call. Uh, and, uh, and then in doing so, that will then enhance and make you a better doctor. I think the humbleness part is that you don't know everything. is very importantly embedded in this, and that's why we all need mentors. Uh, I think you've got some great representatives here uh, on your faculty. Uh, meeting Dr. Smith last night was phenomenal. Meeting him was like seeing a number of people that him and I know quite well, from Joe Wilson Jr. to a number of great, uh, great clinical teachers that we knew at Emory that, that dedicated their lives to their patients, literally dedicated their lives to their patients. I think you have an opportunity to talk about this subject. This is uh, medical humanities, I think, at its most important and best. Thank you all. <laughs> Can answer some questions. Comments would be good too. Yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Watkins uh, made a big point about his main mentor, Vivian Tomlinson. Yes. Uh, I'd be interested in your comments. Right. <clears throat> so, Vivian Thomas, who here has seen the movie Partners of the Heart? If you haven't, you need to go, on, go online and get it. Um, so, Digress just briefly. So author uh, Alfred Blaylock, born in 1899, the great year Fred Astaire was born that year, Jimmy Cadden was born that year, Ernest Hemingway was born that year, uh, was uh, from South Georgia, 
born there and went to uh, college at University of Georgia. Roommate was Tinsley Harrison. And he go, went on the train at Hopkins and uh, the, was really much one of the early surgical researchers, uh, was interested in shock research when he was at, on the Vanderbilt faculty. But he got very busy in the, in the, on the wards and needed someone to run his clinical research lab. And it turns out uh, he sought some advice from uh, a lab next door to his lab, and they offered uh, this gentleman Vivian Thomas, an African-American who had just finished Pearl High. He was just a high school graduate, not going to college, but was, apparently had great hands. He was working in the carpentry shop. So he came into Blaylock's lab, and Blaylock taught him how to do ex animal experiments. And Blaylock immediately recognized he was dealing with a genius, uh, literally a man who could figure this stuff out with him. He was... He would run the lab while Bullock would be in the operating room all day, all the dog experiments on shock. We're keeping the notebooks, writing the articles that Bullock would then write and sign. And when to Bullock went to Hopkins uh, to be the head of cardiac surgery, he, Vivian Thomas came with him, and uh, they began the experiments on the blue baby that uh, led to amazing surgical results for kids with cyanotic heart disease. And Thomas was important and seminal in that work. Uh, Finally, at, towards the end of his life, was acknowledged by Hopkins and has a portrait hanging there uh, at Hopkins. I will say that he's a son of Nashville, and we are, I don't know if this was teed up for me or not, but this, two days ago or yesterday, I was on the phone with Vivian Thomas's granddaughter. And we're now taking the same portrait, digitizing it, we'll hang it in our main light hall amphitheater next to Blaylock's portrait. We're going to have an unveiling ceremony on May 15th and invite his family, all who are alive, to talk about his importance to Nashville, Vanderbilt for science. And so, important man. Thank you, sir. Yep. I wonder if you could comment on the story. So, a number of years ago, I was at a, kind of a lecture uh, praising a famous surgeon uh, who had just passed, and they were reading kind of what people posted online, social media. And one was a posting from a nurse who talked about how she met this doctor after one of his surgeries when she was a new nurse taking care of the patient post-op. And uh, she was sharing how um, he immediately knew that she was nervous and didn't have to, but he went up staying bedside all night. Wow, wow. And uh, mm. you know, and everyone was praising this, this story. And then the person next to me, whose father was also uh, a famous doctor with me, said, what a jerk. You know, not only did he miss bedtime, he missed breakfast the next morning. You know, his daughter at the time was probably about six years old. Yep. And then he worked the whole next day. He's probably too tired the next night. I wonder if you can comment. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, the first uh, discussion was correct. Well, I, I think we're in a changing time. I think the whole thing about work hours got really distorted and has turned out to be erroneous. I don't know if you're keeping up with the body of research on... We do know people certainly can be sleep deprived, don't get me wrong, but I think the whole concept that was placed almost 10 years ago was overstated. And some recent research was done with surgical programs, Vanderbilt was one of them, that showed that if you do let people off after working all night, after, that you don't see these kinds of things happen. I think it comes back to how you view yourself uh, as a physician. I think there's a changing concept about uh, being a physician is just a job. It's not a job. I, I'll have to stay firm with my concept. It is a ministry. It's a calling. Uh, at its best, to be your best, it has to be viewed that way. We're not dealing with machines. This is not an assembly line. You're dealing with people entrusting with them, as DeSantis said, the most sacred thing that they have, and that's their life. And families entrusting with you the most sacred thing they have, their family members, their father, their son. And so if you put it back on yourself, it, it actually works better. What would you want for your mother, for your dad, for your most loved loved one, you want the doctor who did the surgery sitting there by the bedside, checking those vital signs all night, helping the nurse take care of them. Take care of them. When uh, Robert Guyton, uh, the Guyton textbook of physiology, had like eight or nine kids, you know the Guyton physiology book? You might know that book. You know that, uh, that Arthur Guyton of Jackson, Mississippi, had eight or nine kids. Do you all know that? All of them are physicians. Did you know that? All went to the University of Mississippi. All went to Harvard Med School. All brilliant. Uh, Guyton himself was probably the first biomedical engineer. That's another topic I can talk about. But uh, the uh, elder, Dr. Guyton and his wife, their, uh, Robert's mother, were in a terrible car crash about uh, 10, 12 years ago in Jackson. And uh, his father was killed. Uh, and his mother was terribly uh, injured. Robert flew to uh, Jackson 
Mississippi, got uh, the uh, hospital to offer him a pass or whatever immediate ability to be on the staff. He slept on a pallet next to his mother's bed the entire time she was there, helping the doctors, you know, being there to comfort her and to assist in whatever this tough decisions going to make till she passed. So, what would you do for your mother? What would you do for your sick family member? So, thank you.